Father in heaven, we thank you for your word, which is rich and true, which brings life into the darkest of hearts, which causes your son to be glorified, which causes the blind to see, the lame to walk. We thank you that through your word, all things have come to pass. And we pray, Lord, that now as we sit under the preaching of your word, that you would take it and by your Holy Spirit, you would press it into our hearts that we might see and save a Christ, that we might see the majesty of the Lord on high, that we might worship in the preaching of the word, that you would bless us ultimately with yourself, Lord, and we would go out from here being able to say that we have met with the living God and we have heard his voice. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks, Andrew. Well, it's good to be here, Logan. Thank you for welcoming. And uh, it's been a long time since I've been a Covenant. Um, it must be 10 years or more since I've been here, so it's good to be back uh, <laughs> after such a long time. Also, I just want to say, before I just read the scripture, just say thank you to Covenant. I know there's a lot that are not here. Um, for your support for us in, in Tauranga. Um, your prayers and um, and some money. That you, you don't know if you send it, but they did. Thank you very much. Um, we really do appreciate that. And um, and it was great to have uh, Logan and family and a few others with us last Sunday as we had our official opening service a year late. But um, it was a great time, and I know the local people were really encouraged to know that there's there's there is a wider <laughs> church out there that really care for them as well. So thank you very much. Thank you for letting Logan come come again. I don't know if you know, but he serves as one of my elders, so if he looks a bit stressed, it's probably my fault. <laughs> well, I'd like to read tonight from, from the Gospel of Matthew, uh, chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. I'm going to read the first 18 verses. God's word says, Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that, you, that they may be praised by others. Truly I say to you, they have, their, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father who knows what you need before you ask Him, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray then like this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive, your brother, if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will you. Your Father, forgive your trespasses. And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces, that, they, that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Amen. May God bless his word. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this day. As Logan has mentioned, this is a day of grace. It's a day of privilege. 
of opportunity that you give to us to come to you before you, to worship you, to receive of you grace. Lord, we thank you, therefore, for this opportunity again this evening to, to come before you. We pray now, Lord, as we come to your word, that you would enable us again to receive grace, more grace from your word through your spirit, so that we might be strong in our faith in you. And then as we go into the world to live our lives, we might live it in a way that, Lord, is a blessing to those who we come in contact with, that is a witness of who we are, and above all, a glory to you. And so we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Well, just a little question. In life, who is it that you seek most to impress? Maybe a family member, if you're a child, you know, it's very easy to want to impress your parents. Maybe someone at school or at work. And the question then, the next question is, I guess, wh why do we want people to notice us or be impressed by us in some way? Maybe, if, you know, I watch my grandkids, they sort of behave and try to impress mum and dad so they get more screen time, you know. <laughs> Not as if they don't have enough already. Maybe it's because, you know, we'll be seen as a good bloke at work or a good bloke S and we'll get a promotion. Or maybe we just want people generally to think of us as, you know, a good person. Those are not bad reasons, I guess. Nothing wrong with those things in themselves. But in this text that I've read, Jesus picks up this idea of um, impressing other people. But what he touches on is something that is a little unsettling. He tells us that we are vulnerable to wanting to have other people be impressed by us purely, well, we just, want, we just want them to think we're a great person, but we want that more than perhaps we seek the favour and the blessing of God. We may use our, our faith or our life of, of righteousness for our reputation, for our earthly reputation, more than in heaven. And so Jesus says, beware of practicing your righteousness <clears throat> before other people in order to be seen by them, for then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. And in the text, he just highlights um, three religious duties of the day that were being used in this way. And so you notice first he talks about giving to the poor. He says, thus when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets that they may be praised by others. Now both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament scriptures, we, we are told that giving money or giving away wealth is regarded as, a, as an act of, of worship. Think of Malachi 3, Verse 10 in the New Testament, 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9, that many of you would be familiar with. And here Jesus assumes that in accordance with the, the Old Testament law, the disciples as a part of worship are giving money to the poor. Again, nothing wrong with that at all. In fact, it is, is commended. But what Jesus is concerned about for some of the people is the motivation behind the giving. Jesus tells us that some people are giving their, their offering for the poor accompanied with a great public performance. He says some march with trumpeters blowing a, a fanfare, you know, attracting, if you hear a loud noise, you look, well, what's going on over there? And you see a crowd and he says, this is what some people are doing who are giving to the poor. Now that is most likely, a, you know, he's, there's, there's maybe some exaggeration in the language there to get a point across, but it's most likely a reference to a tradition where, where um, a public fast and prayers were announced with the blowing of trumpets. Uh, one writer says that such occasions back then gave an opportunity for a great show of ostentation. That's a big word, isn't it, for a Sunday night? So the picture being painted is a person who is doing something good and commendable, but their motive is being questioned. The giving to the poor was not out of a sincere compassion 
for the plight of the poor, but rather was to promote the image of the giver. This, Jesus says, is play-acting. It's hypocritical at being a God with, uh, in terms of being a true worshipper of God. The second thing he talks about is prayer. Jesus assumes that his disciples and his followers will pray. It, it is a good thing to, to pray. Um, prayer is a means, we know from Scripture, of communion with God. It was a means to, to humbly come before God, who is the giver, as, as um, James says, of every good and perfect gift. It is an opportunity to come before God and, and confess that he is Lord and worthy, and, and we are not so worthy. But we are, by nature, sinful. It is an opportunity to come to God to receive the grace of wisdom, to know how to live, what to do. In all regards, we would say that prayer is an awesome privilege, isn't it, for us, from God. And so to abuse that privilege of grace and to use it as leverage for a mere earthly reward just to get a reputation is, well, how do we say it's quite insulting to God, isn't it, and his grace. And so Jesus once more says, these people who pray in this way, drawing attention to themselves out on the streets, uh, hypocrites. It's quite interesting that Jesus is very direct sometimes, isn't he? He's not always that polite figure that a lot of people think that he is or should be. He says they have their reward. Their reward, he said, is, is the praise and adulation of other people. Oh, my, look, look at that guy. Look at out there. You know, he's praying. Man, he must be a marvelous Christian person. Well, Jesus says, that's what they wanted, that's what they get. And thirdly, he talks about fasting, and I want to jump down to verse 16 here. Again, Jesus seems to take it for granted that his people will at times practice fasting as an act of spiritual devotion. Now, what is known is that the disciples of Jesus did not fast while Jesus himself did fast. In Matthew 9, we're told, Then the disciples of John came to him, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? Well, what is fasting? Well, strictly speaking, it was going without food for shorter or, or longer periods. And in Scripture, fasting is used for it was to be practiced for a, a number of uses. First, it was a sign of humility before God. You can go to the Psalms, like Psalm 35 for this. Sometimes it was used as an expression of distress over the sin and guilt of the person fasting. And we can think of people like Nehemiah and Daniel. Another purpose of fasting was to prove self-control over the body. For example, a habit like greed or something similar to that. Fasting was also um, a means of entering into the life of those who were poor or who had very little. <clears throat> Isaiah 58 has much to say about that subject. You can read it for yourselves another time. There's a lot to say about fasting and in, in including its, its wrong use that Jesus is addressing in this text in, in Matthew. Isaiah says, Behold, in the day of your fast you seek your own pleasure and you oppress all your workers. So he's a reference to somebody who's employing other people and they're having... A, you know, putting on a big religious show, but they're treating their workers very badly. So whether for confession or for self-discipline or for joining with other people in their poverty, yeah, good reasons for fasting. I won't ask how many people here practice fasting. Um, I'm not very good at it, I have to say. That probably shows a little bit. <clears throat> but Jesus, again, observes the same problem as the previous two issues. They fast not because they have a concern for sin, for justice, for self-control, or for the poor, but that they might be seen to be you know, very pious and, and righteous before other people. They're so serious about their fakeness that they put on a big 
act so that it almost looks real. He says they disfigure themselves and put on a false solemn face and yet it's all a spiritual fraud. <clears throat> it reminds me of a sign two years ago when I was, um, Helen and I had, had, had the privilege of being able to travel to Ephesus, which is in Turkey. And as you drive up to the ruins of Ephesus, there's a row of shops, you know, the old tourist shops that are there. And one of them has got a big sign up saying, Genuine Fake Watches. <laughs> You've been there? Yeah. So the watches are fake. And they're telling you that it's genuine. They're genuine fake watches. So you know, that's exactly what these people were. They're genuine in what they're doing, but they're totally fake. So these religious practices have been carried out with genuine, genuine hypocrisy, falseness, fakeness. Jesus says, watch out, because you might fool people, but you can't fool God. He knows the secret motivation at work here. And he says he will reward accordingly. So what do we learn from this text briefly? Okay. You had a short sermon tonight, right? <laughs> yes, please. I, I'm feeling tired. I, I said to Helen, I'm probably going to fall asleep in my own sermon tonight. But... <clears throat> well, from the tone of the text, it's very clear that Jesus who is the Lord, who is God, is very disturbed by fake devotion, worship, service that is expressed by some. It'd be fair to say he's not happy at all with those who he, who he seems to indicate should know better. And so he issues some pretty strong warnings to these people. Again, you can fool people, but there's no fooling God. So with all that in mind, it'd be very easy to stand up here and use this text to tell you, know, you all off and say, don't be hypocrites, wouldn't it? But when we read carefully, we actually find a lot of relief in this text, I think. How so? Well, here the, in this text, it really gets to the heart of devotion, of worship, of service, that is pleasing to God. And when it comes to these things, <clears throat> it's this simple. God is our audience of one. It doesn't matter what other people think. Other people are not the main factor in this matter. We have no call to or pressure to impress other people. It matters first and only what God thinks. Now, I'm not saying that our Christian lives don't matter to other people, because the Scriptures do deal with that. We are to be an example to other people, but that's not the subject here. And then he tells us what is acceptable worship or devotion and service. And so I've got two things about those things. Number one, God loves it simple. Simple is good. The text describes three ways where people are engaged in devotion, worship, and service of God that in itself seems very, very worthy. There were people who gave money to the poor. Well, that's good, isn't it? There are people who prayed, he says, on the street corners. My word, would we not be very happy if we saw that happening in our country? People praying on the street corners. <clears throat> we would think revival had broken out if we saw that happening. And fasting, in a very material age, in a very self-focused age, you know, we all take the photos of ourselves now, don't we? For an old guy like me, that's still strange to get used to. I hardly still, you know, looking in the mirror is a difficult thing. But to take a photo, so, so that's the age in which we live. Would we not be so blessed by an attitude of, of self-reflection that requires fasting, that does fasting. So we need to be clear, Jesus is not diminishing the importance of any of those things. It's not a text to say, you know, don't give too much money or don't have public prayer or don't fast. Rather, he's encouraging us to see what God, the creator, the sovereign, the Lord, the king, the supreme in power, 
the, the one who is perfect in glory, mighty God. You know, I saw a picture of our space the other day that somebody took, I think, when that, that eclipse was happening. Did you see that here in Auckland? We, of course, in the Bay of Plenty had a perfect view. <laughs> and, and I saw a picture of, 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 of what someone took and the stars. And the, it's just amazing, isn't it? Just the sky was just full of the glory of God in the creation. Well, that same God, so perfect, yet he, and powerful and amazingly big, yet he requires just on, only humble, simple, sincere worship and devotion and service. In 1 Samuel, the writer says, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Surely, Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to listen than the fat of rams. And you all know Psalm 51, for you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with the burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. O oh God, you will not despise. What does the writer of James say? God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. You see, worship that God requires is that which is sincere and true, even, even if it is simple and less than perfect. And you get the sense that the worship and, and devotion and service that God loves is that which is born out of a heart of awareness of, of my failing, of my need both spiritual and material, and my expectation that, that truly in God do I find the fulfillment of all the things that I seek for, including, and we'll notice this in a minute, my reputation. See, this is illustrated in the giving of what we know as the Lord's Prayer, and I'm not going to, you can, you can have a little sigh of relief, I'm not, we're not going to exegete that tonight, but it's in the middle of this text. This prayer teaches us exactly this point. In verse 7, Jesus says, When you pray, do not heap up empty phrases or babbling as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. See, sometimes in church, and I don't know whether you've ever been in this part of a discussion like this when it comes to prayer, we you know, we can think, we, we can have talk about prayer and say, well, you know, how, how should we start a prayer? How, how long should a prayer be? Um, should we use these and thous when we pray? Should it contain certain repetitions? Like, should we say Jesus lots of lots of times just to make it effective? Should we stand or sit or should we walk around the town? What, what how, you know, how do we pray? But when you come to the Lord's Prayer, all of these things become very, very unimportant. John Stott says this, in telling us to address God as Father in heaven, Jesus not teaching protocol, but with, but with truth, that as we recall who he is, then we come with the right frame of mind. And so the Lord's Prayer, as it is called, is very, very much a, 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 it's a very simple prayer Yet Jesus encourage us, encourages us to see that it goes into the ears, if you like, or to the throne of the God who is worthy, the worthy God of heaven who alone is able to forgive, to provide, to protect, and to ultimately give life, eternal life. Reminds us that when we pray truly and sincerely, we bring nothing to the place of prayer. We bring nothing to God, but we leave with, with everything. We come with a, with a broken soul, maybe, and a heart prone to sin, needing forgiveness. And Jesus says, pray that you will be forgiven. We come in life needing daily healing and helping grace. And Jesus said, you, you, you know, it's a very simple prayer. We can't even see to the place of prayer, to the throne of God. We don't even bring our own lunch. He says, pray that your Father in heaven will give you your daily bread. But it's very simple, isn't it? It's not complicated. And so we remember the story maybe of the tax collector 
who says his simple prayer before God, born out of a simple yet profound understanding of his need to be before God, very humbly and simply, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And he didn't find that in the book of big, big systematic theology, did he? Simple, yet before God. And Jesus says, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. And I don't know about you, about you but I think this is all good news. I think about this sometimes when I'm um, driving to, or preparing for church in, in, in Tauranga on a, on a Sunday morning, putting out some chairs, maybe first mopping the floor, you know, where the people who have been in the night before have spilt beer all over the floor. Sometimes in the middle of a you know, hot day, we have the doors open and a dog runs into our church service and it causes mayhem and then it, then it, then it runs out again. Not very impressive by, impressive by comparison to some churches that, you know, I saw one that's come to Tauranga recently and they've rented a massive big um, auditorium in town and they've already got their sign up on the expressway there with this pastor and his smiling wife grinning down on every passing motorist. Or those who have a lovely old stone chapel with history oozing out of the stone walls. And I think, you see, here's the thing. God doesn't care. Isn't it a relief that God does not measure us by the stuff that in his mind does not matter? You know, you may not tonight understand all the great doctrines of the Bible of predestination or superlapsarianism. Ask Logan what that is. You know, when I, think of, when I think of a text like this too, I think of the children and I think of the aged among us. They who do not have the ability to express with great eloquence words and worship or, act, or do acts of devotion and, and service and yet can know that, that there is a God in heaven who is pleased with their humble offerings. Those things they do, those prayers they offer are acceptable and pleasing to him. You know, in, in Palmerston North, when I was, we were there, we had a wonderful ministry to elderly people in, in a rest home where people basically went, you know, they weren't coming home from there. And... There was one man there who, who we used to, he used to say, what do you want to sing today? Oh, Amazing Grace. Well, that's a surprise, isn't it? So we sing Amazing Grace. And how does it go? Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound. They're saved. A wretch. And when we got to that line, this man would always go, saved a wretch like me. And he would cry. And I think, see, there's a man at worship. There's an old man where the world couldn't care less about him. He said, my church don't come and pick me up anymore. He used to go to a big church in town. He's too old. He's not cool enough to be in their church. But I wonder if his, his reward in heaven is not greater than all the lights and the, and the smoke machines and all of that are in some places of worship. Tonight, when you devote yourself to simple, yet humble, sincere, spiritual worship and service to God, he is pleased. He is pleased. For he is your audience of one that cares. And the second thing we can take from this secret service, and this really builds on the first point, except it does relate to more what we do, and it deals with the question of why we serve God. From, from the examples given, it seemed that some people, Jesus is saying, believe that their piousness is so wonderful that everyone should be aware of it. You know, it's the, it's the, I'm sure there's no one like the sick covenant. It is the person who is, aren't I so righteous and sacrificial in all my, my life? I give and I serve and, you know, I do that and no one really helps me and you should know about it. But Jesus says, I love service that is discreet. 
and for the Father. He says, your right hand not knowing what the left does. Well, how, how does that work? It's almost impossible, isn't it, in human terms? But what he's saying is, this is how discreet it should be. This is how quietly, and not, not secretly hiding it, but, but, but just how your service ought to be for the gospel. See, this is very encouraging, I think. Especially if you're a really shy person. Or you don't like public you don't like being in public. You don't you know you've never you you're never gonna be in an upfront ministry that you're quietly serving the Lord and his people. I remember um years ago going to a conference over there in the big country of America. There were quite a few famous preachers at this conference. And one of them, a young guy, you know, his name starts with Mark, last name ends with L, he came on the stage and he hadn't said anything. And all the young hipster boys got up and, yay! And I'm thinking, whoa, wait a minute, I haven't said anything yet. See, I'm not blaming the guy, but I think, you know, that's a problem, isn't it? What, what is that all about? I think the church, in the church we can have a problem. We, we think that those who preach, you know, those who are up the front, or maybe those who do the music, they're the, real, they're the people really serving God. They're, they're, the, they're the people really, you know, worshipping God in a way that God is noticing and he's impressed by. I don't think so. Not according to this text. You know, don't compare yourself to others who seem to do so much better with both serving publicly or with devotions. You know, I've met Christian people who feel so guilty because they can't even read. I remember once years ago, this taught me a, a really, you know, important lesson with a lady, you know, she looked like just any middle-aged woman from any place, and they, her and her husband ran a business. And she said to me, I want to do some Bible study. Okay. So she came around to her house, and we sit down, and we, I said, did you read that? And she just burst into tears. And I said, what have I done? She said, nothing, I can't read. I've never learned to read. I was like, what? And so, so she felt so inadequate you know, he's sitting down with someone who's a pastor to, and it's like, oh, no. See, don't be shamed by the person who announces they arise at 5 a.m. and do one hour of morning devotions or who prays 30 hours a week for every missionary that God knows. It was Trinity's um, 20th anniversary today. That's where we were this morning's. It was quite, I was a bit confused, a bit emotional because last week was our opening in Tauranga and then today we're in Trinity and we're having 20 years of celebration. But they asked me at Trinity, they said, can you tell me, tell us a story of, of, of somebody, you know, something. And I said, well, where do you start? There are so many stories to tell. But I remember this, there was a man who came, you know, we just... We hadn't even started the church, and it was on my last day of service at, at, at Drury, and a, a new man came into the church, an, an elderly man, although I'm nearly his age now, but you know, so he's not so elderly after all, perhaps. But he didn't know me, and after the service, he came straight to me and he said, because I announced that I'd be leaving and I'm going to start a church, and he said, I'm coming with you. He didn't even know me. He said, I'm coming with you. So okay. Well, when we started the church, this man, he was late 70s and he went into his 80s and he used to say to me, Andrew, you've got the gift of the gab. I said, excuse me? You know, he said, you can talk. And I said, well, maybe a little. And he said, I can't. So he, I, I can never do what you do. 
Well, we used to have prayer meetings, and, and he would come. He came to everything, everything the church did, he would come to. And at the prayer meeting, we would pray, you know, as you do in a prayer meeting, and you pray with your friends and, and the others from the church. But he would say, well, I can't pray. I, don't, I, I can never pray like that. But he said, I can do this. So we would pray, and as, as we prayed, every so often there was a little pause, he'd jump in, he'd read from the Psalms or something like that, just a scripture. And that was his ministry. And the other thing was, he used to pray for every person in Trinity every week. And I'm probably the only person who knew that. But you see, here, here is a humble man who, who served in, in, in secret. And I know that his reward in heaven is beyond my understanding and possibly much, much greater than those who have had you know, far more public ministries. Because the Lord saw him. And the Lord saw his heart, that it was true and sincere. And he was serving the Lord, not for self-recognition, but for the glory of God and the good of his people. And so this text is, is I think, wonderful. It's a gentle, yet it's a clear call to serve God humbly and serve him with the gifts and opportunities we have in him. And to do it just simply and secretly for his glory. And then know, even if others may not see, he will reward. If no one knows or, or no one comes to you to commend your work or pat you on the back or gives you a standing ovation, just remember that God sees your prayer for others. He sees your service for others, and he will give what is far more important and lasting than any than anything anyone else can ever give you. His reward is with you. It is with you in Christ, the greatest gift that he has given us all. John Stott says, God is always, always looking for opportunities to pour grace upon his people. That's his joy. That's his pleasure, both now and forever. He gives and he loves to give. He loves to give to the lowly, to the humble, to the struggling follower like you and I, as we seek to serve him in all our weaknesses and frailty. And he gives and he gives and he's given overflowingly in Christ so that we don't have to impress others and we can't impress God more than when we come to him in Christ's name and through his total giving, serve and give humbly ourselves. And so tonight I just close. You know, this, this text really helps, I think, to get a perspective on the God that we worship, a God that we serve. My life might be simple might be, I may not be, in, I think people call them influencers now, don't they? These people who go on the internet and they influence you with certain products and things. You may not be that, nor recognized by others, but your God, he notices and he is in what you do for his glory. Amen. Yeah, let's pray. Lord, we thank you again for letting us be here tonight. Thank you for every grace that you've given to us through your Son, the Lord Jesus. And we thank you that it's in his name we are able to serve and to, 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 to devote ourselves to you. And so, that, Lord, we pray for each person here that would be so, knowing that as we do so, Lord, you're a God who rewards and gives back to us. Thank you, Lord, for, for this church, and I pray that you continue to pour out your grace on them and in them and through them in every way. Bless them, prosper them, grow them, we pray, for your glory in Christ's name. Amen.